very good afternoon to everybody it is indeed a pleasure to invite you all for this inaugural iitf deficiency program which is a unique program which we have developed basically which incorporates each and every aspect of iitf deficiency a lot of issues in terms of evaluation in terms of assessment and management and many of these problems are actually not really uh, catered for in terms of appropriate finance so what we have done is that over the next two hours or so we'll focus about the various aspects of iitf deficiency right starting from pathophysiology which is in itself a complicated issue to take over in terms of when to think of the conditions uh, which will be discussed by dr neha then we'll take forward with regards to the evaluation the etiology going forward in terms of the role of igf1 and bp3 which dr sajili will take over then we'll have the growth hormone stimulation and dynamic test dr riddhi will take over then subsequently we'll talk about uh, in terms of management in terms of the conventional gh therapy the long acting gh therapy with dr chetan will be talking about subsequent to that we'll talk about pubertal modulation the role of gnrh analogs and uh, the role of aromatase inhibitors dr pratik and finally igf deficiency so this is going to be uh, overall a compact program of 2 to 1/2 hours in which we'll cover a lot of these things starting from basic pathophysiology to the different aspects covering different uh, pro uh, the whole aspects and gamut of this disorder of igf1 which is extremely important to, to understand because this is a wide spectrum in that perspective so if we look into our entire physiology which we discussed starting from dhrh to gh to dh action igf1 deficiency can represent either growth hormone deficiency or growth hormone insensitivity now growth hormone deficiency can happen as part of a multiple pregnancy hormone deficiency and it's very important to identify that because there is a huge issue with regards to the overall overlap of the effect of growth hormone on thyroxine and cortisol and vice versa that becomes important and this could be a tumor insult or a genetic cause or isolated deficiency which can be genetic and idiopathic remember a isolated idiopathic growth hormone deficiency in a older child is a diagnosis of exclusion and we have to be very very careful because we may be missing a intracranial lesion so my major concern in a acquired isolated gsd is first whether it's really growth hormone deficiency or not and secondly whether there is an underlying tumor in that situation or not or we can also have a primary problem like a growth hormone receptor igf1 gene or igf1 receptor this is basically a problem in which it's similar to a primary hypothyroidism or a secondary hypothyroidism so this is a primary igf1 deficiency and secondary abnormalities will include malnutrition liver disease which you have to always exclude before you diagnose growth hormone resistance for in, or you know, insensitivity very importantly severe ghd in the setting of a growth hormone deficiency type 1 which is a growth hormone 1 gene defect will develop growth hormone antibody with treatment and this will result in a picture which is pretty similar to a growth hormone insensitivity in that regards so igf1 deficiency could be because of growth hormone deficiency or insensitivity deficiency can be multiple pituitary hormone because of malformation genetic or insult or infiltration isolated because of genetic idiopathic causes and finally we can have a defect in the growth hormone receptor igf1 gene igf1 receptor or secondary causes in that regard so malformations are particularly important and we have to consider them with early onset growth hormone uh, deficiency particularly this include holoprosencephaly which is basically a very severe defect in the four brain fusion so you will have things like cyclopia you will have a single central incisa there could be a microcephaly and these features will really pick up very early early onset multiple brain hormone deficiency will be characteristic pituitary stock interruption syndrome if you see this mri picture this is very very classical what you are seeing is that your posterior pituitary is lined up that looks like a topic one the anterior pituitary is small and down so it's not been able to go up so this is basically a embryonic defect and because the anterior pituitary is not going up your pituitary stock is interrupted so this is ectopic posterior pituitary hypoplastic anterior pituitary and there is a problem of stock and this is a classic manifestation of what we call pituitary stock interruption syndrome very common as part of a environmental insult as part of a fetal insult or as part of genetic etiology and we can also have septoc dysplasia in which there is a problem of the uh, absent septum pellucidum optic nerve hypoplasia and uh, this is something which is important to consider in a differential of a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency especially if there is blindness if there is roving nystagmus 
think of a subtopic dysplasia in that regard. Now, we have discussed about the genetic causes. They can be the early onset, SX1, SOX3, LHX3, PTX1, PTX2, which will cause multiple other abnormalities like eye, ear, forebrain, uh, spine, as well as teeth. So if you have these abnormalities, we're talking about proximal defects. They account for around 5% of all causes of, of uh, multiple predatory hormone deficiency. Then we can have defects in PROP1, which is the most common cause of familial MPHD. It causes deficiency of growth hormone, prolactin, TSH, along with evolving effects on ACTH as well as neurotrophins. PROP1 F1 presenting very early with hypothyroidism along with TH and prolactin defect, which is their then we can have a GHRH defect and a GH1 defect. So MPHD can be part of HSX1, which causes optic nerve hypoplasia, SOX2, SOX3 causing hearing and eye defects, PTX1, PTX3 causing sensory neural hearing loss, LHX3 causing a spine problem, absent predatory stock in LHX4, and PROP1 may actually cause an enlarged predatory temporarily, which will look like a predatory mass, and you've got small predatory in PAW1, F1. So if you have an extra pituitary manifestation, many of these proximal genes are involved. If you have specific pituitary morphology, we're dealing with PROP1 or PAW1, F1 in that situation. Isolated GHD can happen in the setting of a severe defect in GH1 gene, which if you start treating will cause antibodies to form. GHD1B, which is a recessive form, a milder form, GHRH defect, which does not cause hypoglycemia and micropenis, as we discussed, and has got its own characteristic facial features. GHD2, which is variable, which progresses to multiple predatory hormone deficiency, which may be sometimes reversible also in that perspective. And then we finally have an X linked form. Now, these defects will present usually early with severe growth failure and will not have other interpretary hormone deficiency, with the exception of GHD, in which we have a destruction of the uh, other pituitary cells, GHD2, in which there is a splicing defect. So this accumulation of abnormal GH will destroy not only the somatotrophs, but the surrounding cells causing evolving MPHD. Traumatic brain injury is an important cause of uh, the effect. <coughs> now, what we need to remember is that growth hormone cells are on the periphery. So these cells are likely to be affected by not only the trauma, but also going to be affected in terms of vascular damage. So if there is a damage, this may evolve over time. There could be an acute abnormality in the form of HPA axis and DI, which improves over time. The most important chronic problem is growth hormone deficiency. So every child with a significant traumatic brain injury should have a growth hormone evaluation on follow-up. Very importantly, birth trauma, <coughs> like a forceps delivery, like a breech delivery can also cause a picture of growth hormone deficiency and monitoring becomes important. Radiation damage is absolutely important to identify because this has got the maximum effect on the hypothalamus. So the GHRH axis goes first with minor radiations about 12 where the growth hormone deficiency happens. So if you have got any hormone deficiency with radiation, GH will be the first one. So it has always been associated with that. There could be a precocious puberty beyond 18 grays. And this precocious puberty may mask growth hormone deficiency because you do not have that decreased growth because precocious puberty is pushing your growth. So this is the second condition in which the growth may be normal <coughs> or in fact compromises precocious puberty. The first one is of course hypothyroidism, which we have discussed. So low dose can cause early puberty. As the dose increases, we have the effect of the cortisol, we have the effect of the thyroid. And finally, delayed puberty. So there is a whole spectrum in terms of radiation induction and the sensitivity. Growth hormone deficiency, very common. Everybody will have GHD in that perspective. Now, if we talk about the effect of cancer therapy on the growth hormone axis, radiation affects both hypothalamus as well as pituitary. We have got also effect of steroid, which is commonly used in terms of treatment of a number of conditions. There would also be the effect of cranial irradiation, which causes a spinal compression. So you may falsely overestimate growth deficits in a radiated individual. And if you give growth hormone, you will not get that much benefits and you will have more disproportion. So generally, if somebody has received spinal irradiation, do not use growth hormone in that particular setting. 
Tyrosine kinase inhibitors are commonly being used in treatment of CML and they actually inhibit the pathway of this IGF action. So this is something, a very complicated situation, will affect growth. This effect is more with younger individual, higher radiation dose and longer duration. Spinal growth, as I said, can be affected. And IGF-1 and GHRH are unreliable markers in this setting because if you use the GHRH stimulation, because the GHRH deficiency is the main cause, you may have a falsely normal response in that setting. So assessment would be a growth hormone stimulation. Management is growth hormone after one year of correction. Infiltrative disorders like histiocytosis are very important between two to five years of age. So if there is a rash, seborrhea, particularly a polyuria, polydipsia, DI involvement, hepatosplenomegaly, think histiocytosis. Beyond six years, always think of a large lesion like craniopharyngiomas. So if you have a lesion like this, which has got a solid and a cystic component, some calcification, pituitary rim, think of craniopharyngioma very importantly. And we can also have rat case cyst, which is a congenital malformation, which is basically an abnormality in the rat case pouch with the adenoidal epithelium in that setting. The growth hormone insensitivity can happen if there's a problem in the extracellular domain, in the intracellular domain, in the STAT pathway, in IGF-1 gene, and finally, IGF receptor. So this is an entire spectrum which may be there. And the features are also different. So extracellular domain is what is conventionally known as Laron syndrome. is associated with severe growth failure with low growth hormone binding protein. Intracellular membrane has a postnatal growth failure with normal growth hormone binding protein. STAT5B defect will cause milder defect with immunodeficiency. ANS defects is very, very mild, so this is usually not being picked up. IGF-1 gene defect is something which is very important. So anything above the IGF-1 gene defect, the birth size will be normal, as Neha said. But if you have an IGF-1 gene defect, or if you have IGF receptor defect, they will be both prenatal as well as postnatal growth failure. And this will be extremely important to identify and manage in that perspective. So we have now discussed in terms of the etiology, we touch base upon assessment, the key questions to be answered are, is it IGF-1 deficiency? Is it growth hormone deficiency or growth hormone insensitivity? And finally, what is the cause? So to identify the IGF-1 deficiency, they have very clearly said that we need to have a very strict oxological criteria before we go ahead with biochemical tests. And this is our algorithm, which has been developed uh, based upon our own patients and what we have seen is that if the height is yes, more than minus two, nothing needs to be done unless they have a clinical point to disease. If it's between minus two to three, you look for two things, corrected height SDS to exclude familial short stature and a height standard deviation score for bone age, which corrects you for CDGP. If both of them are normal, you do some screening tests, which includes the whole battery, CBC, SGPT, creatinine, electrolytes, thyroid, uh, and celiac disease if it's normal follow up. And if you do not grow or your height is less than minus three standard deviation, you look at your dysmorphism, disproportion, do a screening test. If they are all normal, do some nutritional workup like uh, calprotectin, IgA, and blood gas. And <clears throat> only after that, and only after the karyotype in a girl, should you do a growth hormone test. The reason for this is that these tests have a notorious both positive and negative predictive value. Somebody who is GHD may be missed, but somebody who is not GHD will also be picked up as GHD because there is a inherent errors in these assays. So it's very, very important to have your oxidological criteria very clear. Your pretest probability should be high before you do a growth hormone evaluation in that setting. Otherwise, it causes confusion in that regard. <clears throat> so in terms of evaluation of the GHRH, GHIGF1 axis, you can look at the growth hormone level, you can look at the IGF1 level, you can look at the IGF BP, or you give growth hormone and see how the IGF goes. So we'll now go into the various tests and how we can really evaluate. Now, this is an interesting case. 10-year-old girl, height is 120 centimeters, weight is 15 kgs. What we see is that she had mild anemia, TTD was negative, IGF1 was low and was referred as a IGF deficiency. Now, what we see here is that this girl is a classical nutritional cause of growth failure. And as Sajiri will now discuss, is that we have to be careful in this setting in doing IGF-1 because IGF-1 is ultimately nutrition dependent. 
and this was falsely diagnosed as IGF deficiency.